Two things before we start the video. First, this is the second part of a Resident Evil retrospective series, meaning that there is going to be a lot of references and comparisons to the first video, so if you haven't seen that, you should probably watch it now. Second, I'm going to be spoiling the entirety of Resident Evil 2 in this video. If you haven't played it before, I highly recommend that you play it yourself before watching this. Now to the video. The year is 1998 and Resident Evil has made a huge impact on the gaming world. Fans are clamoring for the next entry in the series, making Resident Evil 2 one of the most anticipated games in history, and with good reason. Production on a sequel began incredibly quickly and the footage showed looked promising. Resident Evil 2 was being headed by Shinji Mikami, a person who I've already sung the praises of in my first video, but now he's being teamed up with Hideki Kamiya. Yeah, that's the real photo of him. What a guy. Another video game developer with an equally impressive lineup of titles, many of which are shared with Mikami. Resident Evil, Devil May Cry, Phoenix Wright, Okami, as well as Bayonetta, One for 101, and an upcoming game at the time of writing called Astral Chain. He is a man most well known for over-the-top action, campy settings, and uh, uh, blocking people on Twitter who tweet English words at him. Hmm. A now titled Resident Evil 1.5 was nearing completion when in the inner workings of Capcom they decided that the game needed to be open to sequels, which led to the rewriting of the story and eventually to a complete reworking of the entire game to match it. That's right, they made a nearly complete game and then scrapped all of it just to start over. If that doesn't show dedication, then I don't know what does. Unfortunately, that dedication likely cost Mikami his placement as director of RE2 because him and Kamiya constantly got into disagreements about where to take the sequel. Because of this, Mikami stepped down as the official director and instead took a role as producer of the game. This game was eventually released in early 1998 and was given even more success and critical acclaim than its predecessor. Resident Evil 2 was selling like crazy, topping sales records and managing to beat top dogs like Super Mario 64, and it continued to sell well because it was ported to nearly every single available console at the time. It remains one of the most beloved titles in the series, and it recently received a remake of its own, which also sold incredibly well, likely thanks to its imprint on the gaming world. What exactly did it do to improve the formula provided by the first entry? I want to discuss this, and whether or not you should still play it today in my Resident Evil 2 retrospective. So. Where to start with the game? I guess I should discuss what version I'm going to be talking about, because there are a lot of ports currently available to choose from. In the description, I'll put a video that does a very good job of explaining all the differences between the different ports, but I'll summarize their findings here. The PC port of RE2 has the most content available, including a new hard mode difficulty that is unlocked after completing the game. However, it's also lacking the auto-aim feature that I so generously praised in my RE1 retrospective, so that's a no-go. The next best option is the GameCube release, which offers basically everything the game has to offer outside of that hard mode. More specifically though, I'm going to be using the publicly available HD remaster made by some fans of the series. This remaster makes everything in the game look significantly more clean by upping the resolution of the textures and making it an absolute joy to see the game again through clear lens. For things like the backgrounds, it looks absolutely stunning, but when it comes to the textures of people, it becomes a bit… uncanny? When their faces are all pixelated, there's a bit of an imagination at work to fill in the blanks. But now, when you can see their faces clearly, it just looks like a bunch of dollar store masks are flailing around at me. Still a great remaster though, and I put a link in the description for anybody that would like to try it for themselves. Second, we should talk about canon. Resident Evil 2 has stepped up from its predecessor by not offering just two alternate campaigns of the same story, but now four campaigns, each with a unique story and cutscenes that cover events of the same story overall. Whoever you play first will be designated the A scenario, and whoever you play second will be designated B. Meaning that there are four total campaigns featuring our new protagonists, Leon S. Kennedy, a rookie cop who wants to help everybody he possibly can, and Claire Redfield, the sister of Chris Redfield from the first game. Just like the first game, there's no official canon campaign to the story, but Claire A and Leon B are widely considered to be the closest to the canon, so that's the storyline I'm going to be talking about when I discuss the plot. The game begins two months after the events of Resident Evil 1. We now know that Jill Valentine, Chris Redfield, Barry Burton, Rebecca Chambers, and Brad Vickers all managed to escape from the mansion and report their findings to the authorities. That doesn't seem to have helped much though because cannibalistic murders are still occurring and the police don't know what to do about it. Cut to Claire Redfield, traveling to the remote town of Raccoon City to find her brother, Chris, who has gone missing since the events of RE1. 
Meanwhile, in a nearby gas station, it seems that a trucker has been attacked by a crazy person. That guy's a maniac. Why'd he bite me? Oh, why'd he bite me? Love him. Claire enters a diner only to discover that the lone waiter is a spooky zombie and then is saved by Leon S. Kennedy, a rookie cop who overslept on his first day at work and likely saved his own life in the process. Wait, don't shoot! Get down! <gasps> we can't stay out here. Head to the police station. It'll be a lot safer. Turns out the whole city is overrun with spooky zombies, so the duo make their escape in a nearby police car. The two introduce themselves and then they get Claire armed. What's going on? I arrived in town and the whole place went Great. insane. The radio's out. You're a cop, right? Yeah, first day on the job. Great, huh? Name's Leon Kennedy. Nice to meet you. Mine's Claire. Claire Redfield. I came to find my brother, Chris. Did you open the glove box? Sure. There's a gun inside. Gee whiz, Claire, why don't you sound a bit more excited? It's only like he's providing you the only means of protecting yourself in this horrid wasteland. Then suddenly, a zombified version of Leon's model sneak attacks. Look out! Oh man, things can't get any worse. Oh no, shit, look out for the truck! separated they agree that they should meet up at the police station to hopefully find some help and then the game begins holy shit this beginning section is intense you're able to see the sheer destruction of everything that has taken place. Shit's on fire, people are dead, and there are about five zombies right in front of you. A new player may try to fight off the horde, but it surely will be a futile attempt as you don't nearly have enough ammo to take on all the enemies. So the game is immediately teaching the player their first lesson. When shit looks bad, fucking run. I think the sequence is great, but remember that whole tirade I did in the Resident Evil 1 video about how the whole tank controls of RE games are fine, you just need time to adjust? Well, God help you if this is your first experience with tank controls, because these enemies are right on you at the start. You will either learn to avoid, or you will die. But even then, it kind of goes against what the game is trying to teach you, because a lot of these enemies are placed just off camera where the player is running, almost like it's setting them up to run right into them without them possibly knowing what's ahead. But receiving damage isn't as bad as it once was. Zombies do still pile up on you, so often when you get grabbed by one enemy, you shake them off only to be grabbed again. But now whenever you get grabbed, you can mash buttons in order to shake off the enemy faster and take less damage. This of course comes pretty naturally to anybody who plays these kinds of games, because button mashing during a stressful moment usually happens regardless of whether it helps or not. I think there's a part of all of us that just feels the need to mash our way out of danger. And this time, it'll actually help us because you can clearly see the characters shake off the enemies as you continue to mash. Remember when I said that the original Resident Evil had some ugly and barren backgrounds? Well forget that, these backgrounds are absolutely loaded with details. These backgrounds make the original Resident Evil look like a pile of crap, which it sometimes was. This whole game is filled with beautiful backdrops, and despite being dated by today's standards of CGI, they still perfectly capture the environment to give a believable and clear understanding of your surroundings. The backgrounds are also more involved in helping the player this time because they hide items in places where it looks like something might be hidden, but isn't actually visible to the player. I look right here, and there's an open police locker, maybe this police has some bullets in there, maybe- oh look at that, they found some bullets, there you go. This promotes the player to actually click around to try and find things that are hidden, whereas before you'd usually just get some informational text about the surroundings. You still get that here, but at least it immediately tells you whether or not something is here or not. Claire flees into a nearby gun store and meets a nice man named Kendo. Who are you? What are you doing here? Don't shoot! I'm a human! Ooh. Sorry about that, babe. 
I thought you were one of them. What's going on in this town? Hold on. I ain't got no clue, darling. By the time I noticed something was wrong, the entire city was infested with zombies. But don't you worry, girly. You'll be safe in here. I'm keeping a close eye on this. <laughs> she dodged a particularly rapey bullet here if you know what I'm saying. In the next area, the player is cornered by enemies in a narrow hallway along with some ammo to take them out, teaching the player the second most important skill in this game, how to attack. Speaking of attacking, Resident Evil 2 has made sure to include the auto-aim feature this time. But for some reason it's turned off by default and hidden away in the options menu, so you have to turn it on in every new game. Oh, oh what? Uh, oh, okay. okay. Uh, yay. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Claire continues through the city and the player is shown some beautiful scenes of carnage while also being taught all the things they need to know for the game. Enemies cannot climb. Zombies can sometimes be run past. Zombies sometimes crawl and must be shot by aiming down, but if they grab you then you can immediately kill them in one hit. Enemies can be hidden off screen, so you have to be wary of where you progress in the game. It's a hard tutorial for sure, but it's definitely one I would describe as brilliant. The game even tries to push you further by having a secret easter egg obtainable by playing the game on normal difficulty and not picking up any items along the way. Once you reach the police station, you can head downstairs to find <gasps> the zombified body of an alpha team member named Brad Vickers. Yeah, the guy who saved you in the first game. He's dead! It would seem that not everybody from Alpha Team is doing too well. If the rest of this introduction hasn't told us already, then this surely tells us that shit has hit the fan. This Brad zombie is particularly more durable than all the other zombies, and I swear to god he is near impossible as Claire. Okay, see, Leon's gun has a total of 18 shots, the perfect amount to take out Brad without needing any additional damage. But Claire's gun only has 13 shots. This means that the remaining health that Brad has has to be damaged with Oh god, the knife. The knife is just as useless here as it was in the first game, but at least then, in Resident Evil 1, you'd have a knife to cut down the webbing in that Black Tiger boss fight. Here, it's 100% useless, and if you are playing as Claire, you have to use it to kill Brad. Or, you could just not be a fucking idiot like I am, and don't assume that Brad despawns if you go inside the police station. You can just go inside, pick up some more ammo, and then come back out. There's actually no reason you have to kill him right up front, so... I'm just stupid, I'm sorry. Once Brad is defeated, he drops a key that can be used to unlock alternate costumes, and even a new gun for Claire. The gun replaces capacity for firing speed, and I definitely prefer using it. As you can see in this clip, it looks like Claire is having a pretty bad time, like one hell of a tummy ache. That's another way that Resident Evil 2 managed to blow its predecessor out of the water. Now each character has a specific animation for their health level. As I said in my Resident Evil 1 video, health is distributed into four levels. Fine, Yellow Caution, Orange Caution, and Danger. Before, to check on your health, you had to pause and check your menu to see your current standing. Now though, your character's animation will immediately tell you your health level. Not only that, but your running and rotation speed is also slowed down the further down on the health skill you go. Meaning that if you're in danger, you are more likely to die because you can't properly run from enemies. And if you're trying to go for a speed run, then you'd probably want to be on the higher levels of health because it makes you run faster. Now there is an even greater reason to keep your health high besides just staying alive. Claire enters the Raccoon City Police Department, or the RPD. Wait, RPD? Where's, where's the C? So they're just the Raccoon Police? Okay. Claire enters the Police Department and meets Marvin who fills her in on what's going on and gives her an item to proceed before locking the door to protect her from his zombification. Apparently, the outbreak just started one day ago and nobody knew what to do about it. The police were woefully unprepared and no clear instructions were coming from the chief of police, Brian Irons. To make things worse, it seems that there is some horrible non-human monster roaming around there killing people left and right. The card Marvin gives you allows access to two different rooms, but you're just supposed to go down one at the beginning of the game. I think the game subtly tries to tell you where to go though. Can you tell me any reason why you might not want to go through this door? Take the other door, and we get this.
fucking brilliant. In your average horror game or movie, this scene would be along with a loud stinger or something, a sudden musical cue that would make you startled. But here, here it's subtle. So subtle that the player might not even register that they saw anything at all. This scene is just sheer brilliance. It's like the opposite of the sudden jump scare of the dog jumping through the window in the first game. I love it. I, I love this scene so much. And the game continues to build further upon it, with a trashed room, the decapitated body of a police officer, pools of blood, and then... <gasps> wow, okay, so we're already pulling out the big guns. In the first Resident Evil, we didn't even see the game's big scary common monster, the Hunter, until over halfway into the game. But here we are, not even 20 minutes into Resident Evil 2, and we meet the Licker. Lickers are actually very similar to Hunters in terms of gameplay. They're fairly fast, they have powerful jumping attacks, they like to swipe at your legs, and you have to shift between aiming straight and aiming down to hit them. The difference is, though, that Lickers are somewhat slower than Hunters, and when they swing to attack, they enter a cooldown that gives player plenty of time to run away or attack back. Hunters would take about four shotgun rounds to kill, but the Licker only takes about three, meaning that they still pose a very real challenge, but they don't eat up all of your ammo if you're playing with somebody who only has the shotgun. The Lickers also don't have eyes, so they don't immediately notice you when you enter a room or get near them. They will start chasing you if you start walking next to them, but at that point you can usually just run by them and run for a door or something. This leaves their overall difficulty in the hands of the player. Are you a hurt little babby who cannot afford to cross a licker? Then take it slow and you might survive. Are you a pro speedrunner who don't give two shits about no licky motherfucker? Then just run right by them. This is why I feel that lickers are infinitely more interesting and well designed than hunters. While we're talking about the enemies in Resident Evil 2, I'd like to talk about some of the monsters that were improved from the first game. First are the mob enemies, the ones that group together and attack you en masse, specifically the crows. In Resident Evil 1, the crows were a guaranteed encounter in pretty much just one room, and the room was so small that you were pretty much guaranteed that you were going to be able to run away from them without taking any damage. Resident Evil 2 fixed it by having long, narrow hallways that the player has to go through multiple times. You probably will get hit by the crows this time, and that's actually an improvement. There is one area in the sewers where a bunch of giant cockroaches start to swarm you. Seems like a kind of unique enemy that I'm surprised they don't use more because that's the only room they show up in. The giant spiders from Resident Evil 1 have also been improved by being in more than one room that's super easy to avoid them in. Now they spray acid at you from the ceiling and you actually have to put effort into avoiding them. Not a lot of effort, but you know, it's better than the first game. There's also a cool feature where whenever you kill a giant spider, a bunch of tiny little spiders will spawn from their body. Introducing a new mob enemy that's pretty neo. The game's common enemies have also seen quite the improvement. Zombies are now way more detailed than their RE1 counterpart, along with significantly more variety when they are in a group instead of being a cloned the same zombified person over and over and over like it was in the first game. The overall number of enemies has also been increased too. In Resident Evil 1, seeing more than three enemies next to each other was a rare sight, if it ever happened at all. But here, zombies are everywhere and it makes the player feel like they're actually battling a horde of the undead citizens in a city that has lost the battle for survival, rather than just finding a single zombie in every single hallway as a simple obstacle. It's like you can see the code in Resident Evil 1. You can tell exactly how the developers designed a hallway to be the perfect combat puzzle, but in Resident Evil 2, things are way more blended. It feels more haphazard in a good way, the way things would feel in the beginnings of a zombie apocalypse. Another small note would be how zombies fall down after they take enough damage. Just like in the first game, you can bring a zombie to the ground by dealing enough damage to it. But that doesn't always mean that the zombie's actually dead. What really signifies death is the pool of blood that forms around a dead body whenever you've actually killed it. If a zombie isn't actually dead, then you may accidentally end up walking into it, and then it'll start biting on your legs. A new feature that I really appreciate, though, is that whenever you do kill an enemy, their bodies begin to wiggle around as if they're still somewhat alive, because you can't kill a zombie by shooting it in the body, you gotta take out the head. Of course, this has no actual gameplay impact, but it's really creepy seeing the bodies wiggle around after you've already killed them. The game continues on in the same manner that you've been accustomed to for a Resident Evil game. Puzzles, light combat, problem solving. We even find the Office of the Stars team members, along with a diary from Chris explaining that they can't seem to make any headway because the Chief is constantly getting in the way of taking down Umbrella. While there, a new fax comes in hinting at something called the G-Virus and confirms that Chief Irons has indeed been taking bribes to cover up Umbrella. 
The grenade launcher is also found here. It works the same way the bazooka did in Resident Evil 1. Grenade rounds for crowd control, flame for plants, and acid for living monsters. And one last thing while we're in the star's office. If we go over to Wesker's desk and click on it 50 times in succession, then we get a really awkward photo of Rebecca Chambers in a basketball uniform. Is it just me or does this photo look super weird? Like her head was cut out of another photo and then pasted onto this one? Just as we're leaving the star's office, we catch sight of something that looks like a little girl. And in the next room, we meet up with Leon, who seems to have also made it safe and sound to the police station. Made it. Yeah. Have you seen a little girl around here? Yeah, you just missed her. Who is she? I don't know. But it's too dangerous for her to stay here alone. Leon, I'll go look for her. You go and find us a way out of here. Of course. But before I forget, here's a radio. That way we can keep in touch if something comes up. Then we hear a scream. Wait, where, where did that come from? Is it behind me? It's not like it happened in the room I just came from, but I, I need to continue on to this other door first. Well, it turns out that the scream actually was behind this busted door that seems like it's part of the background. I suspect this puzzle wasn't exactly obvious to everyone who plays the game, both because it went over my dumb head, and also because as soon as you pick up the C4 needed to blow up the wall to get into the next part of the game, out of nowhere it reminds you where and how you're supposed to use it, which doesn't happen anywhere else in the game. Speaking of something else that never happens anywhere else ever again, check out this door transition. You see this passage and you think it's going to be a normal door just like anything else and then... I may be crazy or something, but if I remember correctly, this is the only time that something like this happens to change up the usual door animations, like in the entire franchise. What's up with that? This was such a nice surprise and I'm amazed nothing like this ever happens again in the sequels. I'm not saying driving into the ground or anything, but it would have been nice to see something added in the future installments. Inside the room we find Chief Irons with the dead body of the mayor's daughter. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I thought you were another one of those zombies. Are you Chief Irons? Yes, that's me. And just who are you? No, don't bother telling me. It makes no difference. You'll end up just like all the others. That's the mayor's daughter. I was told to look after her. But I failed miserably. Just look at her. She was a true beauty. Her skin nothing short of perfection. But it will soon putrefy, and she will turn into a zombie within the hour, like all the others. There must be some way to stop it. In a manner of speaking, there is. Either by putting a bullet through her brain, or by decapitating her completely. And to think that taxidermy used to be my hobby, but no longer. Please. I'd really like to be alone now. He comes off as emotional at having failed at keeping her safe. But after he mysteriously leaves, we discover that he's actually quite thrilled to have killed her. As he's a psychopath that wishes to turn her into a trophy, all while making sure that nobody escapes his city alive. Around the same time, we find a little girl named Shiri who seems to be terrified of something coming after her. She uses her small size to crawl through a hole and retrieve a key item for Claire. Sherry, are you okay? Did you find your dad? Yes, I'm okay. But I couldn't find him. But I did find something else for you. Here! Wait, Sherry. This is also where we discover that Sherry is the slowest climber ever. In this basement area, you can open up the police storage to find a bunch of ammo, as well as both a machine gun and a side pack to boost your inventory space by two slots. 
But the catch is that whatever you take from that locker is not only going to be used by the character you are now, but when the opposite character comes by here, they're not going to be able to pick up what the first character picked up. Interesting idea, but frankly, I really only found use for the side pack. I kept forgetting that the machine gun was even there, and you really don't need it at all because you can play the game without it. It also takes up two inventory spaces, so that seems kind of cruel to put it on somebody who doesn't have the side pack. I don't know, I'd, I think I'd say just pick up both items with one character and choose which character you'd rather have no item with. For Claire, a bow gun can also be found, both on the dead body of Kendo at the beginning of the game and at the police station later on. It fires three shots at once, and the damage it deals is enough to kill a zombie on the first shot. But it doesn't get much ammo throughout the game, so it doesn't last very long. It's a good weapon, it's just kinda underutilized. So the itchy tasty journal from Resident Evil 1 was like the high point of that game's storytelling. Well in Resident Evil 2 we get like three different itchy tasty files, and I'm not sure whether to chalk this up as a win because they're about the same quality as the original, but they're kinda just doing the same thing again. Except this time it's told from the perspective of somebody watching somebody else turn into a zombie, meaning that we don't get the introspection of a person losing their mind anymore. After solving some puzzles, we gain access to Chief Iron's secret escape elevator, but get there only just before a mysterious monster infects Irons, leaving him a shambling for help. When Claire enters the room, Iron spouts off a lot of new information. That G-Virus does indeed exist, and it's more powerful than the T-Virus that came before. Shut up! You couldn't possibly understand what's happened. Those monsters from Umbrella have destroyed my beautiful town. How could they do that to me after everything I've done for them? So it's true. You have been working with Umbrella. Then you must know about the G-Virus. What is it? Tell me! If you must know, it's the agent that can turn humans into the ultimate bio-weapons. Superior to the T-Virus in every way! This new strain was developed by a scientist by the name of William Birkin, and Sherry is his daughter. Then, before he can attack Claire, he's ripped in half from within. The creature that popped out of him escapes down the ladder nearby, and we chase after it. It begins to mutate, spouting arms and legs and a long neck with bulbous eyes, and this is what is referred to as a rejected G-spawn. And it is our first boss of the run. And it is... less than engaging. It has this pitiful little swing attack if you get too close to it, but you probably won't, because guns don't need to be close to kill something. This also means that G's only means of attack is spawning a bunch of tiny G embryos that attack you, and they are so useless that they can pretty much be ignored. They even sometimes jump in front of your bullets while you're trying to kill G. The boss dies pretty quickly, and it's a huge letdown despite its interesting design. Now we have to go back and retrieve Sherry, a short but ultimately unneeded waste of time when they could have totally just skipped these two door transitions. It gets worse if you consider the possibility that the player may forget to go back for Sherry, like I did, meaning that you have to endure two times as many door transitions. Sherry then gets sucked down a sewer hole, when we get a glimpse of the creature that's been stalking her. Claire sets off to find her by exploring the sewer sanitation facility, where she meets Annette Birkin, a paranoid scientist that happens to be the mother of Sherry and the wife of William. Annette explains that William injected himself with his own G-Virus creation once he became obsessive of it, and was then attacked by some Umbrella units who were trying to get the G-Virus back. The G-Virus mutates him into one of the most powerful BOWs, or bioorganic weapon, that Umbrella has ever created, and its sole purpose is to kill and infect anything and everything including the Umbrella team that nearly killed him. What, what is this thing? Fire! Fire! You son of a... William's attack also accidentally freed the virus by infected rats, which then infected the citizens of Raccoon City at a rate nobody could stop. Now William is roaming the city searching for his daughter because the monster can only successfully reproduce with a genetic member of his family. Yeah, that's right, William is searching for his daughter so he can impregnate her. 
Kind of awkward when you say it like that, but uh oh, Sherry is screaming for help and William is somewhere around here. Things don't look good. The two split up to find Sherry and when Claire manages to find her, she's attacked by a giant alligator. Time for boss fight number two. Eh. <laughs> The fuck? That's it. Look, I know I said the Resident Evil 1 bosses were often too hard, but I didn't mean make them so easy that you can kill them in one shot. Sherry is found, but she isn't feeling too good. It's clear that she's already been infected by William and thus begins the worst part of the game. A short escort mission. Sherry's a little girl with stumpy little baby legs, so she can't run as fast as Claire. When she gets too far away from Claire, and by too far I mean like five feet, she curls up into a little pouty baby ball. It doesn't help that her AI doesn't seem to know how to walk properly, so she walks into walls and walks backwards all the time. As long as Sherry is with you, you have to do a cycle of running and walking to let her catch up all the time, because if Sherry is busy sitting in the fetal position while you reach a door, you won't be able to progress. My stomach. It hurts. Don't worry. You'll be fine. Come on. Let's go. What the hell was that? Did Claire suddenly get lobotomized in the middle of that cutscene? I should probably talk about this game's acting. So in Resident Evil 1, the best thing about the entire game were the horribly made cutscenes because they were so bad they were good. Is Resident Evil 2's acting better than RE1's? Yes. Is it good voice acting? Chris and the other stars members discovered that Umbrella was behind everything. At the risk of their own lives. But no one believed them. Uh. No. Leon seems to do a fine job of overreacting at things, but it matches the campy tone that the game is trying to set up. Claire's acting is... stunted? Nearly everything she says is out of place for the current situation. But I'm not letting anyone leave my town! Everyone's gonna die! Calm down, Chief. What happened? Why does it sound like she's talking to him like he's a baby? The writing overall is better, but that's not exactly a plus. The enjoyment from the original came from how bad it was. Anything above that is just plain bad. I think Resident Evil 2 skirts on the edge of so bad it's good. Some lines are laughable, some are tolerable. This game is also done with the live action actors choosing to go instead with CGI PlayStation era pre-rendered cutscenes, making every cutscene in the game look so dated that no HD remaster mod could save it. They also look hollow and ugly as pretty much everything from that era did. I was definitely seen worse though. The music, however, is a step up. Before Resident Evil 2, we had pretty much two options. The repeating ambient tracks from Resident Evil 1 and the clowns farting from the director's cut. Here it seems that Resident Evil 2 took more inspiration from the original instead of the director's cut, thank god. The music was composed by multiple people, in fact. And according to the wiki, all the songs were meant to convey a sense of desperation in the underlying theme. songs are incredibly iconic, including the new version of the safe room music that continues to match the sense of safety coded and unease that the first game pulled off. I love this soundtrack. escape the sewers and find a train lift that is being used as a secret elevator to Umbrella's main laboratory. Sherry suddenly takes a turn for the worst, and to make things even worse, there's something big banging on the doors outside. Claire leaves the train and is once again confronted by William. Now, William's pretty much long dead by this point. The only thing alive is a monster called G, named after the virus it came from. And G has many different forms that he takes throughout the game. 
So I'm going to call him G and then whatever numbered form he is from here on out. This version of G mutates right before Claire into G2, featuring a nice detail of William's original head receding into his new body as his original self is slowly lost entirely to the virus. And then the boss fight begins and finally we get a boss fight with at least some challenge. Don't get me wrong, it's still incredibly easy, but he takes a lot of hits and will likely trap you into the corner at least once, requiring you to perform at least some kind of evasion technique. He's incredibly similar to the first Tyrant fight from Resident Evil 1, except here there are corners to get stuck in. Not great, but better than anything so far. After G2 is defeated, Claire and Sherry make it to the waiting room of the lab, and Claire sets off to find a cure for Sherry's condition. In this lab area, the background really begins to shine to me. Everything has so much detail and has so much going on. This game has a lot of great backgrounds, but nothing beats this weird vagina plant that takes up the entire shaft. Speaking of the plant, that's Plant 43. You know, because Resident Evil 1 had Plant 42. This plant, however, doesn't attack you itself. Instead, it spawns these alien-like bipedal plants called ivies. These things are so cool, they act like a sort of tank-like enemy. They aren't fast, in fact they barely move at all, but they can still spit acid at you and grab you if you get too close. Also, look at this awesome animation transition. How when you get behind them, they reorient their entire body backwards because they don't have the same body type as actual humans. They eat up a lot of damage, and because of their spit attack it isn't always smart to stay planted in one place. <laughs> Especially when these poison variants are involved. But Claire gets these youthful flame rounds that one-shots them, making them a joke. Boy, I sure hope Leon gets to this easy foreshadowing. An evolved liquor variant also shows up here. They're just like normal liquors, except stronger and take more hits to kill. Not much to say about them that hasn't already been said about normal liquors. Now they're pretty much meeting the same difficulty that the hunters did. Claire finds Annette again, and she seems less than pleased that we killed her horribly mutated husband. Claire begins to remind her about her dying little girl, but then... <laughs> Oh joy, my disgusting monster spouse is alive. I can't wait to ask him about his dead. Whoa, shit. You're alive. Ah! Annette dies but leaves Claire instructions on how to produce the vaccine. Tell me what I need to know. How can I save Sherry? I have detailed information. Everything you need to know to prepare the antidote is right here. The paper explains the correct process to synthesize a vaccine, but the self-destruct sequence activates for some reason and now Claire has to act fast. She successfully develops the vaccine as well as discovers an emergency elevator that may be accessed by her good friend the MO disc. She tells Leon over radio to pick up Sherry and meet her in her escape train. After using the MO disc, Claire activates the elevator and then G is back and this time he's mutated into his third form. A fairly slow form that shouldn't take more than a few shots. Hmm. He seems to be mutating again. That doesn't bode well. And now he's G4, and I think this fight's pretty simple. It strikes just the right amount of difficulty. It's basically the first Tyrant fight in Resident Evil 1, or the G2 fight, except the boss's speed is increased and sometimes he jumps around the arena. He can still be defeated pretty fast though. With G finally dead, Claire returns to the escape train and just barely manages to find a way on. She meets up with Leon and administers the vaccine to Sherry, tells Leon to shut the fuck up. Claire, what's happened? Not now. <laughs> and waits to see if it works. Of course it does, and the group rides the train to safety, thus completing Resident Evil 2. Or so you'd think. Unlike Resident Evil 1, the A and B campaigns are concurrent, meaning that they're happening at the same timeline. But we're gonna have to talk about that in part two of the Resident Evil 2 retrospective. Join me then when we talk about Leon's campaign.